Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. Today, we're going to be talking about interior stain. We'd like to thank Dave Pratt for sharing and liking the podcast. So I was having a hard time uh, finding something about Egypt and stain. Bummer. So I was going to lead in with... So you're just going to spell the whole podcast? Well, no, I was going to lead in with, you know what happens when hippos get upset? No. Their sweat turns red? Huh. But then I found out that in the early 1900s, Minwax was asked to waterproof Cleopatra's needle. Where's that at? In New York. Hmm. So this is in Central Park. That's that huge Egyptian obelisk. So this was made around 1400 B.C., Wow. And then around 1881, they moved it to New York. Why? And, and the story, because it's cool. <laughs> and the story behind it is wild. So what they, and you know what's interesting about this too, is they put a time capsule underneath this obelisk. Mm. So they have the 1870 census. They have a, a copy of the Bible, a copy of the current dictionary, and then the full works of Shakespeare, plus a guide to Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they developed this formula containing paraffin that would penetrate into it. It would seal the stone, and all they had to use were paintbrushes. Mm-hmm. They built this wood scaffolding all around the mine, and this thing is huge. So they right. built all this wood scaffolding, but the guys were really sloppy. So Doesn't they're not surprise me. <laughs> they're, they're dripping all this all over. And then when they looked at the scaffolding at the end of the day, they said that the wood was so beautiful. They were shocked <laughs> at it, so they left it on. And they treated some of it, and they said that it, it brought out the beauty of the wood, and it wasn't slippery to walk on, so they treated their scaffolding <laughs> with this new formula. So they worked on it, they reworked it, and that was some of the first finishes for floors and woodwork. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to talk about interior stain? So the most common types of interior stain, you have oil-based, water-based, you have a stain with a finish built into it, mm-hmm. and then gel stain. With oil-based stain, the most common use dyes and pigments mixed in mineral spirits, but there's a variety of formulas. And oil is nice because it dries slower than water-based stains, so you have a longer working time, which is really good for large areas like a right. floor or a door, tabletops. Mm-hmm. Oil's good because you're not going to get those lap marks if it starts to dry before you right. wipe it off. And oil doesn't raise the grain of the wood, so there's less sanding. Mm -hmm. It's permanent on most projects. It really shows off the grain of wood. But with oil base, you need to make sure that you have adequate ventilation. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to clean up any spills with a solvent like mineral spirits. With water-based stain, water is going to evaporate faster, so it's going to dry faster. So it's really not the best for large projects like floors. It's low odor. You can clean up with soap and water, which Mm -hmm. is really nice. And actually, the water-based stain comes in a wider range of colors than most oils. That's interesting. And then the weird thing is it raises the grain. So So what does that mean? So you have an extra step. So when you put down a water-based stain on a lot of woods, it's going to pull up the grain. Mm -hmm. And so once you apply your stain, you're going to have to sand it very lightly with an extra fine sandpaper so that it's smooth before you put your finish on. Mm -hmm. And with water-based stains, it works best with water-based finishes. You can get a gel stain, and so this is a... What does that mean? Well, it's a, it's a unique formula. It's very thick. It's non-drip, so it's great for vertical surfaces. And what's wild about gel stain is it'll work not only on wood, but you can put this on metal, fiberglass, on wood veneers. Huh. And, and this is a lot, you'll see, like when we talked about different types of doors. Right. On fiberglass doors, this is what you use to change the color. Oh. And this is going to stick to the surface rather than penetrating. Like most stains, what they're doing is they're actually being absorbed into the wood fiber right. and, and, and changing the color. And each company has their own formula and characteristics, so make sure you read the label. Some companies want you to wipe it on and off with a cleaning rag before it gets tacky, like within two minutes. Some companies, like if you're doing a door, they want you to brush it on very thinly and then use a clean brush and pull it off with a dry brush. Hmm. And it's not for furniture with lots of nooks or crannies because this can get caught up in the corners and it's difficult to remove. (laughs) With a stain and finish, this is combining the stain with a finish like polyurethane, Mm -hmm. but there's different formulas. And this is a very fast way to get color and a finish. 
and you want to put this on super thin and then buff it off, right. some of these formulas will go over existing finishes, mm. so read the label. And m with most of these, if you're going over an existing stain, you have to go darker because it's not going to lighten it up. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise. And with something like the stain and finish, if you want to test the finish to figure out what it is, you can take a cotton ball dipped in acetone, so, you know, old-fashioned nail polish remover, mm -hmm. and in an inconspicuous spot, rub it. If that cotton ball sticks to the surface or it softens the surface, it's varnish, lacquer, or shellac. If it doesn't affect it at all, it's either paint or polyurethane. Hmm. What are some top-rated brands? So you have Cabot. They were established in 1877 and mm. still top-rated. Minwax, and you'll find this in most hardware stores, started in 1914. Varathane, it's V-A-R-A-T-H-A-N-E. They've been around since 1958, and now they're part of Rust-Oleum. Hmm. And General Finishes, they were established in 1928. Hmm. A big part of staining is then putting the finish on mm -hmm. because you're just getting the color out of the stain. Right. But to protect it, you need to cover it with some type of finish. And the most popular are polyurethane, a mm -hmm. water-based polyurethane, spar varnish, lacquer, and shellac. And then you also have different types of sheen, so you can get it in satin, semi-gloss, or gloss. For your interior projects, polyurethane is really popular because it's very durable, it's real tough, it's resistant to water and alcohol, and this can be used over stain, or you can even put this over bare wood. It's going to handle heat really well, so it's good for projects in the kitchen. When you're using polyurethane, though, you'd want to use a respirator. You want to make sure it's very well ventilated. Mm -hmm. The downside of polyurethane is it can yellow over time if there's too much sunlight hitting it. And most of these are going to get a slight amber tone to it, which, which a lot of people like that look. But it's not really for the exterior because sunlight breaks it down over time. Bummer. And you can get this in a brush-on style for flat surfaces. You would like use, in a can? Yes, and you'd use a natural bristle brush for this. You can get wipe on, and this is really good for contoured surfaces, so molding, you know, stair rails. You can also get this in sprays, so for hard to reach areas, great for window shutters, chairs, furniture where it has a lot of intricate shapes. It's like a spray can? Yeah, exactly. Hmm, interesting. And with most of these, with the oil based polyurethane, you're going to want to put two to three thin coats. With water based, it's going to be three to four coats and sometimes less. So read the label. Mm -hmm. You can get a water-based polyurethane, and with this you just use a synthetic bristle brush. It's more environmentally friendly, it's low odor, but you still want to make sure that you have adequate ventilation while you're putting it on. It dries fast, and many of these are going to go on milky, but then they're going to dry crystal clear, yeah. kind of like the clear caulk. Yeah, it's kind of weird when you're using a polyurethane. <laughs> yeah, it freaks you out. It doesn't hold up as well to heat and chemicals. And then there's an extra step on bare wood. You've got to rub the surface with a damp cloth to raise the nap. You want to let that dry and then sand it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to do this a couple of times before you apply the finish right. because of the water in there. And then usually you have to put more coats than oil for mm -hmm. a tougher finish. Again, read the label. It's nice because you can clean it up with soap and water. And then one question we got to ask a lot at the hardware store is, can you use something like a polyurethane over paint to protect it? Mm -hmm. And you can use either oil-based or water-based polyurethanes over paint. Mm, fancy. Can you put a water-based finish over an oil-based stain? The, the key is letting it dry, so it's got a cure. And for most of them, you've got to wait at least 24 hours, but depending on the temperature and humidity, it could be several days. Mm. <laughs> so to test it, they say wipe the surface with a lint-free cloth and you get it damp with mineral spirits. And if it picks up color, then it's not fully dry. And so you need to wait till it's fully dry. But in general, you'd want to use a water stain with a water-based finish and an oil-based stain with an oil-based finish. It's the easiest. Mm -hmm. For your outdoor, I know we're talking indoor, but for your outdoor applications, you can use... So I don't want to hear it. You can use spar varnish, and this stays flexible, wide range of temperatures and conditions. It's UV resistant, moisture resistant, extremely durable. Use it on exterior doors, exterior trim, boats they use it on, decks, and beach chairs. So, I'm not responding. So if I'm you're doing, listening. well, you could do the inside of your exterior door with, okay. you know, interior stain, and then the outside, you, you want to use a spar varnish. Another finish is lacquer, and this is used on high-end furniture, musical instruments, artwork, and this is more durable than shellac. It's generally sprayed on for the best finish. It's very high gloss, 
mm-hmm. but most homeowners find it difficult to work with. And, you know, this was developed by artists in the Shang Dynasty in China. No, like, I didn't know that. Like 1,000 to 1,600 B.C. Hmm. Crazy, huh? Yes. Shellac is interesting because this is a, a natural product that's made from secretions from the lac bug, hmm. L-A-C. In ancient India, farmers found that they could take these secretions, so it, it's almost like a resin. They create this little shell to lay their eggs in, mm-hmm. and they, they lay them all the, all the way up and down twigs, like on little plants. And originally, farmers found that if they crushed all this resin, it would create a red or orange colored dye. And then, and then somebody figured out they could heat this up. It turned into like a real soft, pliable resin. When they mixed it with alcohol, it created shellac. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Yes. Some of the first 78 RPM phonograph records were made from shellac. Hmm. Shellac, they still use on some slow-release medication, so a thin covering of shellac you swallow. Interesting. <laughs> and then shellac... Can I get a list of those products? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then shellac, lollipops, and other hard candy, it's what gives it its shine. Hmm. Funny, huh? In 1849, William Zinser, he settled in New York City and started making shellac. In 1908, he called his shellac bullseye. Because mm-hmm. I love the bullseye one, two, three. The primer. Great primer, yeah. And then another product that Zinser makes that shellac base is their bin primer sealer. So this is for water stains, fire, and smoke damage. Right. It does, a, And so shellac does just an amazing job of sealing out odors and stains. You can seal knots with it. Mm. Very easy to use. It's popular with high-end furniture. Dries fast. You can apply it in cooler temperatures than other finishes. Mm -hmm. It's not affected by sunlight, so it doesn't yellow. And it sticks to almost anything. Wow, are you going to rename this podcast (laughs) Shellac? You know, what's also cool about it is to (laughs) recoat. Like a lot of finishes, you have to really sand it. Mm -hmm. But when you recoat with Shellac, it actually melts into the old finish. Mm. With Shellac, you'd want to clean up with ammonia. And it's completely non-toxic when it's dry. I would hope so, since we're swallowing it. Yeah, but the downside is it can be affected by heat or chemicals, so it's probably not the best for your kitchen projects. Mm. So if you're going to stain something, you want to prepare the surface first, so you want to remove any paint or any finish on the wood if it has something on it already. You can sand it to remove the old finish. Use chemical removers or a heat gun. Mm. And chemical removers, because we had talked about that in a previous podcast, is usually safer for a lot of projects. Right. Because anything pre-1978 can have lead in it, Mm -hmm. and you don't want to sand and breathe that in. Highly toxic, especially for children. Yes, everybody that's listened to our podcast, we talk about lead all the time. (laughs) So if you're sanding items that may contain lead, you want to make sure you're working outside, have thick plastic drop cloth, and you want this drop cloth to extend about 10 feet past your work. Hmm. Close all the doors and windows around your home because you don't want the dust blowing into your house. You want to wear disposable coveralls, goggles, shoe covers, the paper... Or if you have a hazmat suit. (laughs) You want to wear the paper painter's hat so you can throw it out, disposable gloves, Mm -hmm. and wear a respirator. So the N100 is the most common. N means it's not resistant to oil. You can get an R100, so this is resistant to oil, and this is an 8-hour use respirator. And then there's P100s. This is resistant to oil, highly resistant oil, and has a 40-hour use. But read the label. But for most projects, you're just going to get an N100. Mm -hmm. It's going to filter out 99.9% of all airborne particles. That's a lot. After you're done sanding, you want to roll everything up in that drop cloth, put it into a heavy-duty plastic bag, and then duct tape it shut. Mm -hmm. And the EPA considers residential remodeling routine maintenance. So you can put it in regular landfill, but I would check with my local codes to see if there's any restrictions. If you want to test, let's say you have paint on some furniture and you want to test to see whether there might be lead in it, 3M has a highly rated instant lead check kit. Mm -hmm. And so this is a small tube and it has two glass capsules inside with chemicals in it. You cut into the paint or the finish you want to test with a utility knife. And then you're going to squeeze the tube, breaking these two little capsules and mixing these chemicals. And there's a little pad on the end of it. And then you rub it into the paint or the finish. Mm -hmm. And if it turns red, you have lead. (laughs) 
Once you have your finish removed, or if you have bare wood, you, the first thing you're going to do before we stain is to sand it and get that wood smooth. Mm -hmm. So you're going to start with about 100 grit sandpaper and then sand in the direction of the grain. You're going to move on to about 150 grit and then finish with 220 grit. And it really depends on the manufacturer, but basically you want to start with a medium sandpaper, work to a fine, and then finish with extra fine sandpaper. It's a lot of work to stain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, you want your wood perfect. And then for small projects, I really like a sanding sponge. Mm -hmm. They do a real nice job, and they can fit the contours of, of whatever the item is. Yeah, it's easy to hold. And then you want to remove all this dust with either a vacuum, a brush, a tack cloth, or a microfiber cloth. Mm -hmm. For most projects, a dry microfiber cloth works really well, either oil-based or water-based stains. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a little more aggressive, make sure everything's up. You can dampen your cloth with mineral spirits if you're using an oil-based stain. And then you can use a damp rag with water if you're using water-based stain. But the problem is water it may raise that nap. So, when so you got to sand all over them? Right, so you may have to hit it a second time. But mm -hmm. a lot of pros, what they like to do is wipe it down a couple times with a damp rag if they're using water-based products. And they feel it. If there's any raised nap, they just keep knocking that down with 220 sandpaper mm -hmm. till it's super smooth. Interesting. And then you don't want to use a tack cloth with water-based stain. It can interfere with the finish. A hmm. couple of the top rated, Red Devil has a tack cloth and Guardsman. Their dusting cloth were both rated very high. Hmm. Once you're done sanding, you can use a pre-stained conditioner. Hmm. And so for porous or soft woods, this is going to give it a more even color when you're staining. For porous or soft wood like pine, alder, and maple, or even hard wood like maple and birch, if it's light colored, mm -hmm. sometimes it absorbs the stain unevenly. Right. And a lot of the pros are saying they put a thin coat of a pre-stained conditioner on all their projects just to make sure it looks very nice. It's probably smart. And they suggest use an oil-based for oil-based stains and a water-based for water stains. Mm -hmm. And then applying the stain is actually very easy. You can put it on with a brush, a stain pad, a cloth. A lot of people like cheesecloth. Mm -hmm. I if, like using a foam brush. Foam brush is great for nooks and crannies. does a nice job. With oil-based stain, use a natural bristle brush. With water-based, use a synthetic brush. And most stain is best if it's applied between 50 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Make mm -hmm. sure you check your label. Stir the can thoroughly. You've got to lift all those solids off the bottom. So you're just going to wipe or brush on the stain, and then you're wiping it off before it dries. So it's, it's <laughs> pretty well, just putting it on, yep. and then, you know, two, three minutes, you're going to wipe it off. The longer you leave it on, the darker the color, but you do not want it to dry on the surface. Right. Because it'll stay sticky, it won't cure properly, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you have the potential for peeling off. So you just want this to penetrate into the wood and then wipe off the excess. For your first pass, if you want to test for the color, you can just leave it on, you know, very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then you have to wait an hour or so before you put a second coat on. Every company and formula is different, so make sure you read the label how long right. to wait before your second coat. But you can slowly darken it mm -hmm. by wiping it on and then wiping it off. But the key to applying stain is a thin coat. Absolutely. Don't yeah. put too much on your brush. It's a long process. Right. You want to use a clean, dry cloth to wipe off the stain. And then before it's finished, you want to make sure that it's fully cured. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the second key thing is it has to be cured before you put your finish over the top of it. Depending on the size of your project, it's not just cans of stain anymore that you can get. Yeah, you can get squeezy tubes. Squeezy tubes. Or you can get the claws, which were really, you know, if you have a bookcase or an end table, what's nice about those claws are impregnated with the stain mm -hmm. is you don't worry about knocking over a can. It's not going to drip. You just wipe it on, and then once it's you know fully dry, then you put your finish over it. Just make sure you're wearing disposable gloves. Right. <laughs> right. The, you know, the color that they have on the can to stain, Yeah. I, I mean, that's if you apply it properly. To the exact wood uh, that they're right. telling you. Yeah, it, there's a lot of variance in the color. Because everything ends up darker, I would say. Well, it's good to test on a scrap piece or an inconspicuous mm -hmm. spot, because if it's porous or less porous, right. I mean, it's going to look totally different than the picture. Well, especially the first couple times that you try staining, it, right. it always ends up darker. Yeah, and, and, and how long you leave it on, how bright. many coats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, make sure you follow the directions. <laughs> an experiment. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else to add? I'd say just remember that stain is the color. You need to protect it with some type of finish. Mm -hmm. For large projects, oil is the easiest to work with. you got a little more working time. For small projects, water-based is nice because it's going to dry fast, less fumes. 
And then if you want to get the whole process done quick, you can get the stain and finish in one. <laughs> but no matter what type you're using, it's still a long process. Yeah. You have to read the directions, take your time, do it right. And all the prep work is, yeah. is really what's time consuming. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, the Spotify mobile app, and the Google Play Music mobile app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our book, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, on Amazon. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.